Um, I'm 70. But I can see you're excited about this. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <So> <laughs> oh, yeah. Maybe a couple of goats. What was like goats? Um, uh, I imagine that would probably be somewhere in the Mediterranean. Um, probably the um, the speaker who struggles most to pay their bills at the end of the month. I was nicknamed the Lion. Lion. Um, yeah. Right. Oh, <laughs> that one is good. Yeah. Can you close the door, please? Thank you for the question. Yes. <laughs> The next question. You're a villain. <laughs> I am. You're a villain. You're late. Chris, you should mention that it was my question. All right, and okay. I'll tell you the answer again later. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'd like to be uh, introduced as a methodology, somebody who's contributed something to methodology or, or works the area of methodology. Uh, how would you describe your professional uh, trajectory, your evolutionary um, path in your team, so how did you get to where you are in the profession and where are you heading? Um, it started out probably as a fairly, stand, a fairly standard beginning. So I was working in a, a telephone call centre in the UK and I've been doing various jobs for, for quite a few years after leaving uni and I decided I just I, I wanted to do something. I couldn't keep working in sort of customer customer care and, and um, tele telephony, fault reporting for my whole life. So I did the CELTA in Nottingham um, and, and came to Seville. And for the first five years, I was just you know treading water. Um, I I didn't do a lot of reading. I think I read one grammar book, which was by uh, by Jesperson. Written in 1930. Yeah. Um, that, that was, I mean, that was it for the first five years. Did, did you have a teacher training qualification at that time? I had just the CELTA. Yeah. You had CELTA. So I did the CELTA. No higher education yet. Um, Diploma in teaching, higher education. No. Not for teaching, but uh, you had I had something a else. Degree in psychology and philosophy. Psychology so, and philosophy? Yeah. Was, oh, uh, does it help um, in the classroom? The degree, maybe? yeah, it does. I mean, I, I, I read psychology or psychotherapy as a hobby anyway, so I think I think this, it has its applications, yeah. But, uh, um, but yeah, no, then, I, then I went to the Middle East, um, taught for the British Council in Syria um, for a few years, and then I sort of realised there was this bigger sort of picture because there were quite a few ambitious people there, people who were, you know, consciously developing themselves um, and reading. And, and then I realized, wow, you know, and that's when I came back to Spain, I wanted to do the Delta, I wanted to um, push things. And at the British Council in Barcelona, I think, for four years there, I, I went for it, sort of day and night. Uh, so, yeah. That was, the, that was the sort of the, my push, I think. Um, and then moved back to Seville as a trainer. What do you want to achieve in your profession? Um, I would like to see um, teams methodology and young learner methodology in the same place as adult teaching. Um, in, in terms of you know there being um, commercial mainstream courses like there are for teaching adults at the certificate and diploma level, but to see that you know on the table um, because I don't think they're the same. You know, and, and what happened? So many teachers do what I did. My my CELTA course was teaching adults. I did that, that was fine, taught at summer school, came to Spain, my first class was 10 year olds. And I was blown away. You know, it took me a long time to, to get to grips with it. So that, I'd like to see that. I'd also like to see um, uh, the science of teaching young learners and very young learners acknowledged as, you know, as an art, as a science, not just, oh, 
he's good with the kids. Oh, she's good with the kids. You know, to, you know the the teacher who's you know typically branded because they you know they like singing along, clapping. Yeah. I think it's it's such a complex thing. It's, it's there's so much science to it, and I don't think that's you know that's not really borne out with you know when we just talk about stirrers and settlers and and and, and classroom routines is much more so that's another thing i'd like to see usually i mean some countries you can see the most qualified teachers working with adults what do you think about this it's insane it's, uh, what happens is yeah, yeah, your your newest teachers come to a centre and they get given, they get given the little kids. Yeah. Which are the hardest things? I read somewhere that you know teaching um, feeds its its you know preys on the young, in terms of you know the, the the newest teachers get the hardest classes, and the and the new teachers they often um, or what I've noticed in Spain is that they get the elementary adults. If you give a new teacher, element for me, elementary adults are the most difficult level to teach. Proficiency is and, and advanced are the easiest levels. Um, and it's almost like the teachers that have been in a centre for a long time, they slowly get given, you know, um, the higher levels, almost as recognition. And then they teach them and they kind of guard them. And it's like, so I would reverse that. Give the new teachers all the high levels and make the, make the teachers who've been there for a long time teach the teach the, you know, the beginner adults who come with all their sort of baggage um, and learner neuroses and, and, and stuff. And I wouldn't give new teachers the, you know, the little kids. That's, that's another thing that's very, very difficult. I think you need a lot of experience when, you, when you're teaching the, the smaller children. And I've seen, I've seen new teachers implode when they've been given classes that are classes that are too young and they just can't deal with them. And they've got two kids on their tummies under the tables here. They've got another one running around. Yeah. I've had teachers say to me, Chris, what do I do? And what do you do when you want to introduce some new vocabulary? Let's mm -hmm. say there is a word mm -hmm. and you're explaining it and each student does not get it, does not get the meaning. So I do translate it into the L1 or just keep you know trying you know to cope with it and you know teach English through English I I've been teaching in Spain for quite a long time and I I do I use that one and I'm working through lists at the moment for B1 exams with my, with my teams and we do it a, a range of ways so I'll say the we'll look at the word you know, I'll say autumn and they'll give me a Spanish. But then I say, okay, yeah. So how might we define that in English? And then we'll work on the definition. So we're trying to cover all, you know, and then add more, um, add more dimensions to the word um, and, and associations. Um, and I'm sure you know that there's a McCarthy uh, uh, schema where he's got all the, um, different maps of sort of um, kind of a mind map thing. Huh? The issue probably would be that a lot of adult students mm -hmm. and school kids as well they uh, attend English classes two or three times a week, mm -hmm. and you do not really have a lot of time in the classroom to do meaningful activities, introduce vocabulary. Uh, sometimes you want just to cut corners, mm -hmm. just translating so that you maximize the amount of time mm -hmm. to teach something else. So you've got the two evils of getting used to shortcuts, mm -hmm. and then on the other, the, the, the amount of time you can spend trying to elicit or to explain something without. So I mean, yeah, we're trying to avoid both of those. I mean, good, it's good to do some meaningful vocabulary work just in English, but I think also the students have one when they share in our one, it can be you know it can be a, a very useful resource as well. Mm. What are the three most important qualities that the teachers should have? They've got to enjoy, I think, 
some way, being in the room with those people or find a way to enjoy it. Um, and I put that above any type of personality trait or characteristic because if you can't find a way to get something out of being there, it'll it'll quickly go rotten. Yeah. yeah. So, but that would be my probably my one, two, and three. But I remember your first class. Were you a bit worried about entering the class and teaching? Probably afraid a bit. So your first day as a teacher of English. Um, I stood outside the classroom and, and one of the mums came up to me. And you can hear, yeah, the noise coming from inside the classroom. I said, Do I know, is it a professor? I said, professor, professor, is it a French teacher? But yeah. Okay. And, and she said, uh, she said, uh, mi hijo es muy nervioso. Um, which is like, my son is very, and the Spanish word nervioso. Well, I thought, oh, okay, my son is very nervous. Or, uh-huh. uh, I, so I, I said to her, no problem. You know, no problem. Show me your son. Yeah. And she showed me, and it was Hugo, uh, mm-hmm. Hugo, as the, as the Spanish would say. I thought, okay, so I've got a nervous kid in there, so I'm going to go in. And I went in, and I looked around, and I said, you know, where's Hugo? So was it nervous or nervous? Uh, nervous. 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 Yeah. Um, but it was, the, it was the biggest kid. The biggest kid in the corner. He stopped, he looked at me. And he said, Hugo. <laughs> Uh, because I, I was obviously pronouncing that, I, I thought something here doesn't add up. Because yeah. the Spanish, they say nervioso, which is fidgety, restless, hyperactive, excitable. Yeah. Um, she was trying to warn me. Okay. And I was looking at She nervous. was worried about you, not about the kids. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, yes. It took me three months with that student. It took me three months. In the end, he would turn out to be a lovely young man. And he's probably in his twenty thirties. He's in his thirties now. But um, but at the at the time that beginning, he looked at me. He thought, "I'm going to eat that stu- uh, that teacher for breakfast." Yeah. Uh, you know. Um, so yeah, um, that was my first lesson. I remember it very, very well. You write some stories for kids, don't you? I do. Yeah. You have this story about Reagan. Lelo. Yes. And you pronounced it correctly because people often say Reg in Lelo, but yes, Reg and Lelo. When I was a baby in, in Dubai, I was um, not a good sleeper. I was nervioso, as, as the Spanish would say. So my parents used to drive me in a Land Rover around, um, around Sharjah and Dubai just to get me to sleep. And I remember the, the gear sticks in, in this old Land Rover, there was one red button on the top of one gear stick and that one yellow. That's my, my first memory. Of sort of, um, and so I thought, you know, they all sort of came together, like red and yellow, little circles. So I, on PowerPoint, I did a series of stories that were just involved these two blobs, um, one called Reg, Reg is red, and, and playing about with the, the, the not really minimal contrasted pairs, because, you know, Reg isn't a word. Yeah. but. That's yeah. fun. Yeah. And um and that. And uh and then from then from there I think I did another set of stories about a character called Humphrey Bogin, mm-hmm. who's a, who's a boy sitting at the beach, not enjoying himself, doesn't have any friends, doesn't really like anything. That's my favourite one, uh, set of stories. And another series called Fralford and the Vogels. Um which involves this small green circle and large oval circles, the vogels, and every episode, Fralford kills one of the vogels. So what we do in class is um, I'll say to the class, you know, who will it be? Uh, and, uh, and they'll say, I think it's the blue one. I think it's the green one. And they have to predict which one of the vogels gets squished. Um, so they're rough. They're very primitive, but they, they all serve a function. The piano above Kumala says that Chris presented an awesome idea of planning for the past. The last time you were in Sarata, what does it mean? Okay. 
Um, Do you have a time machine or something? Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay. So, um, can I borrow this piece of paper? Yes. yes. Okay. Let's let's imagine this is um, a timeline. Time tube. A time tube. This is the past. Yeah. This is the future, and okay. this is where we are now. Yeah. A basic idea. You move this in the future, and you are also moving the past. Okay. If the thing is fixed. Um, so the idea of planning for the past in, in, in teaching, in the planning, is we look at something we did before, and we think, what can I do today that will make sense of what we did previously? So how can I take an aim that we did? We often start a fresh thing. Now the aims for this lesson will be this, this, and this. If we go back, where did we get to last time? What can we do that endows last lesson with more meaning? So we're changing the future, but we're also changing the interpretations and the significance of the past. Some people want to lock me up for this, but, um, but that's, that's the idea in a nutshell. Yeah. Uh, the next question is from a colleague of mine, from Anastasia. So Anastasia is asking, teaching can be stressful. How do you cope with stress? I turn it into a project. So uh, a lot of the writing, a lot of the talks I give, they're about difficulty, stress, students not behaving the way we want them to. So when something's happening in class and I feel the stress, I, I'm getting my next talk, I'm getting my next idea. So I turn the, 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 the challenging students into case studies. I mean, they're giving me my material. Where did you get your socks from, by the way? Um, I got these. Do you know? I don't know. The last time I was here in this room was. I mean, August. my socks got missing. See, right. <laughs> got a strain on the stomach muscles. <laughs> the last time I was in this room was in August, and this room was full of very young children. And socks. And socks. <laughs> and one, of, one of your students said to me, I took my shoes off, yeah. um, and, and, and I was sitting just, well, just on this one of these beanbags just here. I took my shoes off, put them under there. I'm sitting there, I'm, I'm talking to one of your teachers, and, 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 and one of your, I think, four, five-year-old boy, he said to me, your socks are broken. Your socks are broken. <laughs> and I looked, and they were, and I thought, yeah, they are, and, uh, <laughs> and that. So, so this time I thought, no, I'm, I'm going back with at yeah. least reasonable socks. Someone mentioned that you look like Jesus Christ. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> no. Yeah. Um, I went and did a, I did a talk a few years ago. I, I had my periodically I cut the hair. I did the talk. I came out of the talk, and uh, and the first person to grab me. And comment, you know, sometimes when you give a talk, yeah. people, oh, you've cut your hair. Nothing to do with the talk. Somebody else I found out recently, they called me, I was nicknamed the lion. Lion? Um, yeah. Right. Wow. <laughs> that one is good. I don't think, it, if Jesus were a real, you know, if he did exist, I don't, you know, uh, I don't think, I don't think I would really look like him very much. It's the, Sort of the Anglo-Saxon sort of metaphoric. Metaphoric. It's a, it's an interesting thing. The old the, the old ego and and um, I mean, when you're standing in front of a room and everybody's listening to you. Yeah. It is nice. Do like it. Yeah, I do like it. I mean, I, and before the talk, what do you feel? Do oh. you feel like you're out of breath and you have to? Breathe deeply a couple of times. No, no, I'm, lo I'm really to. lucky. Um, the only thing I feel before is just you know, it's checking the sound, checking the sound on, on the clips, yeah, and and making sure that the sound lead doesn't need that's a stressful. But I, the people I feel sorry for are the um, are the conference organizers because they get the spit. I mean, we go in and we do our hour. Or you know we do a couple of talks and we're all about us, but but I mean they get to see they get if, if there's a if it's a big conference they might have you know I don't know a hundred speakers they've got a hundred divas yeah. you know with all their personal sort of hang-ups and quirks and uh, I mean 
Um, but yeah, so I mean, the, the ego thing is, I think it's okay to, to enjoy the attention. But, you know, as, as long as you don't make assumptions about your audience, you don't assume they don't... You know, some, the worst thing you can do is assume that your audience knows less than you. Yeah, and, and, and that way sort of trouble lies. And the other thing is to, you know, when the people are listening, they're, they're allowing you to speak by not speaking. Um, so you have a room full of people which are suppressing their natural inclinations in order to hear you. But that doesn't mean any more than they want to hear what you've got to say. It doesn't mean that what you've got to say is necessarily just because you're the loudest voice in the room. You know, you are because everybody else has stopped talking to let you speak. Um, and, and, and then when, when, you, when you stop speaking, you should, I think you should be able to walk down those stairs off the stage, sit down and become one of the audience members ready for the next speaker. Um, and in the, in the first couple of years of doing the talks, that was something I didn't, I had a problem with. Like coming down from, oh, everybody's listening to me. Yeah. Um, and so then I used to finish and I walk about and if somebody would come back, it makes it worse. Oh, you know, enjoyed your talk. Oh, and then, and you're still up there, yeah? It's slightly on topic, um, but I, I love the pronunciation talks um, um, where the um, where the presenter is, is, is guiding them through the physicality yeah. of, of pronunciation. Imagine you're 70 right now. What does your life look like? Um, Where are you? Um, I'm 70. Um, I'm I'm sitting in a teachers' conference and I'm speaking later. I think the same. I'd like I'd love still to be doing that. I'd love to be able to still be relevant and have you know and 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 have sufficient things to say and sufficient charisma to be able to do that. Not when I'm seven. Maybe when I'm eighty. You know. That would be um, eighteen. Yeah, you know, um, and to be able to, you know, have the energy to hold a hold a room for, you know, thirty, forty five, sixty minutes. Um, I'd like that. But that is professionally. Yeah. Personally, I'd like to be with my partner, with with my sweetheart. I'd like to have a house with a garden. I'd like to have 20 trees in the garden. I have a list somewhere of the trees as well. There'd be a couple of palm trees. Most of them would be fruit trees. Um, and maybe a couple of goats. I always like goats. Um, uh, I imagine that would probably be somewhere in the Mediterranean. Mediterranean? I think so. Probably Spain. And uh, and be able to walk for as long as possible, you know, um, uh, and, and be mobile. Are you planning to become rich teaching English? Um, no, I'm not planning it. Why not? Um, we would. I was talking to my partner about this recently, um, and. Um, I mean, at the moment, at, at, at most conferences, I'm probably the um, the speaker who struggles most to pay their bills at the end of the month. I still do a lot of stuff. I mean, most of stuff that I do is done on the basis of my my weekly salary, um, and that I haven't got a, an editorial or big publisher behind me that I don't even have a product to sell at the moment. Um, so, um, but am I planning to get rid now? I can't see it, but, um, um, so it's not, it's not in the game plan. It would nice, it'd be nice to have a bit more money, but, um, um, getting rich out of, of, of English language teaching now, is it possible? You know, um, my friend, uh, 
again, I mentioned Robin, Robin Walker, who, who I work with, um, he was organising a one-to-one class, or somebody had asked him to do a one, one-to-one class to, to teach him privately. Yeah. And they, they asked him how much he would charge. And he said to them, okay, well, think about, um, think about somebody who comes to your house to fix your car uh-huh. and works for an hour. Think about how much they charge. You know, and I'm also a professional. I've had training. You know, are we? Do you get where I'm going now? And the person said, Ah, yeah. I mean, I'm valued as professionals, we're not always. Um, but we've also got to go out and get it, haven't we? We've got to go and make ourselves professional. Yeah, but do you think that the part of the problem could be that English language teaching, language teaching generally, is not that effective? Um, that's an interesting one. I mean, can you really take a group of students mm-hmm. and tell them honestly and wholeheartedly that in a year I guarantee that you're going to be at this level being able to do this and this and I have a method or an approach for it and I know 100% how to do it. I think you I think you could do that. I mean it, it but we handicap ourselves in so many ways. So I mean so much activity that happens in the classroom is is wastage. So people waiting to go over the exercise, people waiting for somebody else to answer. Um I think Teachers, well-trained teachers, they have the capacity to actually do that, but probably not the resources. Um, but if you have, if you have um, management and teaching staff working in optimum conditions, and the ones created the conditions for the other, yeah. um, then you can do some amazing things. And I'm start, I'm getting to the point where I'm, I'm getting to visit schools, numerous schools, um, this one included. Um, where people have done special things, and you can see, you can really see language learning when it works. I also get to see a lot of language learning that you know that, that doesn't work, and, and even in my own classes, you know that that wasted time. But but yeah, so we could do it. But um, but as a profession, yeah, I mean, there's there's worldwide, there are millions and millions of. Uh, students probably right now sitting in classrooms filling in exercises which is yeah. not going to contrib- contribute to their English I don't know why I hate filling the gaps right I mean as compared to grammar I can say that I like grammar as compared to filling the gap exercise but I, I think maybe it's I always say to my students it's not filling in the gaps it's what we do with it once we fill the gaps in. and then we have to work the exercise so but when you finish filling the gap, you just get to the next to the next gap. It. That's it. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, maybe, maybe never. I sketched out an article. No, it was going to be a whole project. But to, like, never fill in the gap. One question I forgot to ask you. Which one is that? No, you got. Me. <laughs> it's not. It, <laughs> it's not why he's a native speaker, is it? No, we've done, we've done that. We've done that. You want to talk about that? No, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm not. You want I, to give the definition of I'm what not, the native I'm not speaker the person is? To, to weigh in. Well, <laughs> um, I mean, you know, you, you, I need. I would need to give that a lot of thought. That's a massive question, and to, for the benefit of the viewer, you know. You killed me with that last night. So, um, but it's but I was thinking, yeah, that that would be something. I haven't really, really thought about it. Um, my my partner, she's she's been teaching now. She's in her third year. Um, well, she's Spanish Argentinian, uh, and she teaches English. She teaches English. I think until you've had, if you if until you, it, you can't experience. I can't experience being. A non-native female teacher myself, but until you know somebody a significant other that you know um, 
then you, now I see the you know ELT profession more through her eyes. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I quite enjoyed that. I mean, it was sort of, yeah, it got going towards you know, halfway through to the end. It's, I mean, yeah, obviously you just you're asking me about what I think about stuff, and when people ask you what you think about stuff, and you get to speak, but I could I felt different about at the end of that than at the beginning. Yeah. So I I experienced opening up, and it wasn't because my it wasn't because my perceptions of you were different. It wasn't because of defensiveness, but there was something that I found it a lot easier to talk at the end. <laughs>